In our previous message from Revelation 5, we were able to view a vision in heaven, the presentation of the Lamb. He alone is the one declared to be worthy of taking the book of ownership of all things. It's he who has the right to bring the ending judgment of all things for all time. And in this message, we're going to see what happens when Jesus, the Lamb of God, takes the book. This is also a vision in heaven, and it concerns the worship that's going to occur. Now, there's much talk today about worship, what it is, and how it should be done. Now, in our passage today, in the last half of Revelation 5, all these questions are really answered if we'll hear it. The focus of worship today seems to be how maybe we might construct various elements of the service to meet our needs spiritually and emotionally. And even though it's an experience realized within a believer's life, true worship is not about an experience that we manufacture, but rather a humbling, reverent response to the one who's worthy of all praise. Now, we should have good services, no doubt. And those responsible for the presentation of it should undoubtedly consider the elements that are important for worship to take place. However, worship, when expressed, is a reaction to a pure revelation of God's greatness in our presence. Now, the words that's used for worship in the Old Testament means to bow down and to serve one who is superior. The New Testament word means to kiss the hand in adoration and to serve. So when we combine the two aspects shown in the Old Testament and the New Testament words, worship concerns an attitude of heart that reveals itself in actions of service. Now, Ralph Martin puts it this way, Worship is a dramatic celebration of God in His supreme worth in such a manner that His worthiness becomes the norm and inspiration of human living. Now, our English word for worship comes from an Anglo-Saxon word meaning worth-ship. Uh, in recognizing God's worth, we show how much we treasure Him through our actions. Now, to set the scene for us here in Revelation, now while I read this passage, consider that the very things that we're about to see in Revelation are mirrored in this Old Testament passage as well, and it surrounds worship. Now, give special note to the singing the blessing of the Lord's name, His glory, His greatness, uh, praise. There's fear, honor, majesty, holiness, the world being established, rejoicing, and included in all of that is the judgment of all things. O sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless His name, show forth His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the heathen, His wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Given to the Lord, all ye kindreds of the people. Given to the Lord glory and strength. Given to the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established that it shall not be moved, and he shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful, and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness, and the people with his truth. Now with this understanding of worship, let's now see a vision in heaven, the worship of the Lamb. There is first of all, worshipful reverence. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of colors, which are the prayers of the saints. I want you to take note the basis of the worship which is about to take place. Jesus comes and takes the book showing not only that he's worthy to do so, but that he's also able to do it. He takes it from the right hand of him who's on the throne. Now that means that he has the power to do it. The only one who is worthy and who can take such things from the right hand must be God, the Lamb of God. 
Now worship's about to break out uh, around the throne and there's something always to remember. Worship comes to God for who he is. And these begin their worship of the Lamb. They are indeed worshiping God because of who he is. He's the mighty one, he's the almighty one. The picture is one of the Father on the throne of eternity and Christ coming before him to receive in power all right to world dominion, authority, and judgment. Now the parallel passage to this passage is Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. The focus of the book of Revelation is Christ. He's the one who steps forward in the strength of the Father and his throne, completing God's will for the universe. All things are about to be made right and all of heaven recognizes it. So at the point that this transaction takes place, immediate worship begins. Now what takes place next begins at the center and then it begins to move outward. It goes from the living ones to the 24 elders. And the implication is this, that if indeed the living ones represent the living characteristics of the Father, this worship begins with he who is on the throne. And as we noted in a previous lesson, the idea of God worshiping God is not altogether wrong because only that which is perfect can be worshiped properly, that is, praised for the content of his person. So it's just as right for God to honor himself for the content of his person, just as it would be for the creatures who are less than perfect to praise God for the content of his person. Now going out from the living ones, the 24 elders worship as representatives of the whole of the redeemed and the glorified saints. The actions of the elders are the actions of the entire host of the redeemed. And so like a rippling wave from the center of the throne outward, all of heaven falls before the Lamb. Again, this places the Lamb in the center of the throne and everything that takes place extends outward from it. The subject of worship is the Lamb and their obeisance is before the Lamb. It's to Him that the worship comes as well as the song that's about to be sung. Yet worship can only correctly be given to God. And I think this is God's way again of reinforcing the fact that the Lamb, the Son of Man, the Son of God, is God. For the Lamb to receive and to accept the worship is for him rightfully to acknowledge that he is God and that he should be worshiped. Now we're told that in their worship they each have harps and golden vials full of odors. But I guess the question is, who has the harps and the golden vials? Now the words make it appear that both the living ones and the elders have them. However, the ones implied here are the elders only because they're the closest antecedent to the, uh, the mention of the instruments. They have harps and they're involved in their expression of worship. So not only do they offer worshipful statements about the Lamb, but the singing of praises also. Now in their hands they have these golden vials. These vials are bowls and probably a little flatter in appearance like a curved saucer. And inside the bowls are perfumes, uh, incense that is sweet smelling and pleasant. So the interpretation is immediately given that these represent the prayers of the saints. You know, the preciousness of prayers before God is also represented early in scripture through the altar of incense. Now, the altar of incense was both in the tabernacle and the temple and it was placed close to the wall between the holy place and the holy of holies. The fragrance arising from the altar was a sweet smell, always reminding God of how precious and enjoyable were the prayers of his people. You know, also David helps set that concept and this importance when he speaks of it in Psalm 141. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. The fact in this case, in Revelation, is that the prayers are before the Lamb. It's an indication that the judgments about to happen are the answers to the prayers of God's people. God hasn't forgotten the needs of his children and he's not forsaken them nor their prayers. Uh, he has come, he's taken the book of judgment and he's going to break the seals, read and then enact the judgments of it. And when he does so, 
he will prove that what he does is in answer to these prayers, which are sweet to him. These prayers are all things that are going to be made right, and the fact that sin is going to be judged, it's all going to be answered. And with that thing done, worship begins to break out. There's worshipful singing. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Worship involves singing, and here we see it in its purest form demonstrated in heaven. Now the song sung is new. Uh, some have attempted to use this verse to suggest that Experimentation with new worldly musical styles are backed up in this passage. However, the configuration of musical notes is not what this verse is speaking about at all. The word used here for new means new in freshness. That is, the truth of the song has a new and fresh application because of its subject matter. Its reality would have always been known, but there's now a fresh approach to the singing of it. It concerns what the Lamb has just accomplished by the taking of the book and the breaking of the seals. It's as though this song now has, a, it has an old ring to it, but it has an all-new freshness and meaning when it's sung. The content of the song is foremost. Now, it first addresses the Lamb's worthiness, and it reflects the question posed in verse 2, Who is worthy? Well, no one else was found in all the universe. And after the silence and the truth settling in that there was no one, this Lamb of God came forward and has shown himself worthy indeed. Now, how is he worthy? How can that be known? His worthiness is based on his ability to take the book from the Father's mighty right hand. No one else had such an ability, but the Lamb does. He not only is worthy of taking the book, but he has all the rights to open the book and to break the seals so that the content can be read and then fulfilled. Now, because the seven-sealed book will bring uh, the judgment that's needed and that the fulfillment of the prayer of the saints will come to completion because of it, most certainly his worthiness by ability is suitable for worship. The worshipful singing is also based on the Lamb's work, and that work is his crucifixion. So the content of the song reflects his work for the redeemed. The saints recognize that redemption is possible only because of the Lamb's actions. Based on his crucifixion, the fact that he was slain, it proves that he is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. By his humility and meekness in becoming slain, he has shown that he is the Lamb. It's only through this submission to death that he is now powerful to, as the Lamb with the right then to take the book from the hand of the Almighty. His work has accomplished two things. The first is the eternal realization of redemption. The word for redeem means a simple purchase, uh, such as maybe buying something at the marketplace. It's a price that's paid that exchanges the value of one thing for something else that's desired even more. Now the expression hast redeemed signifies that the act of redemption is once for all. It's accomplished, completed, it's done. And then the elders sing that this redemption is applied to us, is uh, quoted there. Now, of course, this further suggests that the elders are actual humans because only those who are human, uh, part of the human race, are subjects of Christ's redemptive work. So the purchase is then to God. In other words, that which is purchased belongs to God. Now, this is similarly emphasized in 1 Corinthians. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Lamb has made the purchase of redemption, and the means of his attaining it is priceless. It's by thy blood. Now this speaks of the manner of his sacrifice and method of payment. We need to take to heart. Redemption did not come cheap. He stands there in power because of his position as the Redeemer. And the redeemed fall before the Lamb because he's given them the right to be his purchased possession. 
the extent of his redeeming work is to all who would have come to the Lamb for it. It encompasses every kindred, which are clans, tribes, ethnicities. It covers every language group and all people, which include every large comprehensive group. It also comprises nations, which are geographical locales. Their singing shows the all-inclusive grace of God that has gone out into the world. It reinforces the truth that whosoever will may come, and in this case, have come and are now able to sing these praises. From the church has come people from all around the world, of all nationalities, all languages and people groups. Redemption is provided for all who come. The second area of the Lamb's work for the redeemed is their eternal promotion to prominence as kings and priests. The Lamb's humility in submitting to the death of the cross is the foundation for His exaltation. And now likewise, the saints humbly come to the Lamb of God for His provided salvation, and as a result, they too are lifted to levels of prominence in the kingdom of God. It's the humble Lamb who has elevated the lowly. The verb has made also suggests the completed action of this promotion. And that promotion involves being made kings and priests. Listen to John Walvard's explanation of this wonderful advancement. The peculiar privileges of the church are clearly indicated. The church is a priesthood rather than having a priesthood, and is a royal family rather than merely being ruled by a king. The members will not be so much subjects of the kingdom as they will be reigning with Christ on the earth. Here again is intimated the purpose of God to consummate and fulfill the prophecies of an earthly kingdom in which Christ will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. You can see that this purpose will be explicitly fulfilled on the earth. That is, the church will reign with Christ on the earth. We will participate and cooperate with Christ and His will as the millennial reign takes place. Being part of the royal family, we'll have the delegated responsibility from Christ to aid in ruling the earth with Him. Now added to the rulership is the priesthood. Now, the church has been made to be kingdom of priests to God. And although our reigning as kings, as part of the royal family, is not in the present but in the millennial reign, there is an aspect of which we are already a kingdom of priests personally and individually because of the work of Christ. And when the veil of the temple at the time of Christ's crucifixion was uh, split from top to bottom, the openness to the Holy of Holies through Jesus became open. So only priests had such access. And God is indicating that in Jesus, each individual has access to the very presence of God Himself. The priestly reference seems to be more general to our personal approach to God, especially when you take into consideration such passages as 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 9. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. The worship of the Lamb so far has revealed a worshipful reverence and worshipful singing, but it now also moves to worshipful praise in verses 11 and 12. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. At this point of worship, John's attention is rested as he beheld the sight that was before him. He also hears the many voices raised in an outward expression of worship. It's a thought-provoking arrangement of words when John says that he heard the voice, which is singular, of many angels and others around the throne. So the one voice of the many who are worshiping suggests unison and collective harmonies. But isn't that what worship is supposed to be anyway? You know, such is a good reminder, I think, uh, needing to be applied to today's worship services. Worship is not everyone just merely expressing himself or herself as an individual. Now, every response is indeed an individual one, but it's the collective, when we are in that collective of worship service, 
that we should be voicing together one expression that extends to the one who is deserving of worship. And quite frankly, worship is not about us. It's about one central person, and that's Jesus Christ. And if we keep our eyes on Him, then our voice of thanksgiving, praise, and worship just can't help but be about Him as it should be. And then that's also going to be harmonious, and it's going to be unified. Now John hears this praise beginning with the angels, and then the living ones, then the elders, and then the thousands of thousands. Now, as I see it and understand it, there are four categories that are involved here, as suggested by my previous statement. But we see generally those who are the angels. We know who those are. John indicates that he hears the voice of many of them who are around the throne. So that seems to take care of that grouping. Next are the beasts or the living ones. Now, we've seen these already in Revelation and defined these in earlier lessons. Next are the elders, which we also have explained earlier. But then we come to this reference concerning those who are the, uh, this referred to as the number of them that was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So I guess the question would end up being, does this refer to the angels or the living ones or the elders? So let's dissect this a little bit more for understanding. The number of angels already seem to be defined in this verse by the expression many. So it would seem a little redundant to let the reference to angels again be qualified as well as the reference having to now jump over two closer antecedents, which would be the living ones and the elders, to be able to make reference back to the angelic host. In several places already we have seen that the living ones are four in number, so it would seem reasonable to believe that these thousands don't refer to them. Uh, as it concerns the elders, they've already been defined in several places as being 24 in number, and it seems these thousands cannot refer to them specifically. Then who? I think these numbers denote all the redeemed in heaven who, like the elders, speak worshipful praise to the worthy Lamb. The expression of 10,000 times 10,000, if taken literally, would be 100 million. Now, that's a lot. But if that were not enough, it goes on to say, and thousands of thousands, okay, the numerical calculation just went off the scales. And when we consider heaven and all who are going to be there, it seems to me that this is the almost innumerable multitude referring to those who are redeemed by the Lamb. And it would only seem fitting that these would also be included in this level of praise. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Their praise is also a collective and harmonious expression is one. Their great or loud voice is singular, which again shows a unified expression. Each group is not doing its own worship. The worship is universal and it's uniform. The expression of the worship is centered on the Lamb and His worthiness concerning His being slain. Now this is in keeping with what we've seen already expressed. It was the slaying that He suffered that gives him right now and the worthiness to do what he's going to do. The expression of the worshipful praise is sevenfold. The first four focus on the qualities that the Lamb possesses, and the last three concern man's response to him as the Lamb. And let me say right here that we have, an, uh, I think, an excellent example that worship is more weighted on who God is than just how we respond. Now, our response is important but the focus is Him. Our response to Him and about Him has to usher forth from His impact on us. Now, in the original, there's one article that unites the entire list, which indicates that these make up one totality. He is the God of power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Now, the sevenfold character of the Lamb is there because of His work as the Lamb slain. That completed work now confirms what the Lamb has received from it. Power, which is miraculous power. He receives riches, which is the fullness of all things, but also wisdom, which in this case is a higher level of knowledge application through the upcoming duties that He's going to enact. The Lamb receives strength, and this is a forceful ability to accomplish everything that's needed. Those are his characteristics, but as a result of these, he now receives from all creation honor through reverent esteem as God, glory 
through godly worship of his person and blessing through honorable words spoken about him. And is this not what all worship should be and must be? And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now, like a crescendo to the worshipful praise already expressed, every creature in all creation has to react everywhere in the same manner. Nothing is withheld from this worship and praise. Every creature here has to mean every creature. Now, how can that be? Now, we have to understand a higher and a broader truth. When the one who is the center of the universe is honored as center of the universe, all the universe has to respond in its own way to that truth. The point is that every creature in all the world lives and replies in its own way to give the Lamb blessing, honor, glory, and power. Okay, what about those who are on the earth who don't know Him? And those under the earth in hell who have no longer the means of accepting Him? Yet each has, to, has no choice but to confirm that which is true about the Lamb in relationship to their understanding of Him where, even where they are. Their lives, even in evil, are working out the purpose of giving praise to the Lamb slain. Their lives will testify His position, whether in salvation for receiving Him or in judgment in rejecting Him. And such is already the teaching both in the Old and the New Testaments. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant who was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. But how does creation itself get involved in this level of worshipful praise? It is so great is His worthiness and recognition of it that grasshoppers have to hop for the glory of God. Cats meow for the blessing of the Lamb, and the fish of the sea swim in honor of the worthy one. You see, all of creation reverberates on one consistent wavelength of blessing and honor and glory and power to the one who's on the throne. And this goes on forever and ever. Such praise is never ceasing in the sense that the qualities of the Lamb are never ending. Eternal blessing is due because the eternal qualities are always there to be praised. And then the chapter concludes with a worshipful benediction. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. The living ones have one thing to say about all this. Amen. The word means let it be or truly. It is as it should be because he is all that he is ordained to be. His work is complete in humility as the lamb. And now because he is the lamb, he truly deserves what is taking place. And with that, the 24 elders also fall in full agreement in worship. As expressed before, this reaction is eternal because his existence and worthiness are eternal. Let's take this to heart. Worship doesn't stop once the amen is said. Worship is a way of life. It extends to everyone and for all time. As long as the Lamb lives, which is forever, worship will be warranted, exercised, and enjoyed. Let me ask you this. Is your life one lived in true worship of God and the Lamb? Now, I'm not asking you if you're attending a meeting we call a worship service. That's no doubt important and expected. But I'm focusing on lives that all day, every day, live in awe of God's person. 
I'm speaking of a godly response that we make by living in such a way that honors all that we know about God. Please keep this in mind. In all the scripture, there is only one thing that indicates that which God seeks from man. But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. May God help all of us right now, as well as in the future, to fall down before God and worship the only one who is truly worthy.